Well, good evening. I can't think about how blessed we are in this time of social distancing to have this kind of technology available so that we can still spend some time together and still have the opportunity to study together. Uh, welcome for joining me. I'm not sure. I say the. Uh... Ah, Bronwyn. Hello. I have several things I have to do to find out who's with me. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, they put in social distancing here in the U.S., and it's uh, it's rather interesting, to say the least. But anyway, uh, I'm not gonna let us let it stop us, and uh, we're gonna do from dust to stars. Daniel's had a lot of visions, and the vision that he's going to have here in this final chapter is a very interesting one because it's so different than the others, and yet, in some ways, it is exactly the same because of the purpose that God, why God gives us visions and gives us predictions of the future in the first place. So anyway, here we are. We're going to begin with the memory gem. Let me see here. All right. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. What a marvelous text. Those who are bright will shine like the stars. Well, Wisdom is something that comes from the Lord, and uh, we hope that we can show some of it here, and we hope that we can be uh, instrumental in helping people to stay uh, with the Lord. Daniel 12. And Daniel 12 is an interesting, uh, as I said, an interesting vision because it's somewhat different than the others. There is something here about the future in Daniel 12 but not so much. That doesn't seem to be the main purpose. And when we look at it, and we look at visions in general, I think we'll discover that that's not the, that's not the uh, or the purpose of visions in general is very much the similar to this. So let's go to Daniel 12. And at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Now, it's very important to see this book because sometimes, you know, we've had in Daniel 7 a vision of divine judgment. And people tend to, don't, you know, they tend to not like the idea of judgment. It's scary. God is going to judge us, and we are not going to live up to it. We are, we are less than perfect. Well, God knows that. Uh, it's only we who sometimes lose sight of it, I think. And um, there's really nothing to fear in God's judgment, as is being made apparent here. If your name is written in this book, whatever this book is, it doesn't say in Daniel 12 what this book is, but we'll look at it because it's we know what the book is. There's another mention a book. In fact, as we've been going through Daniel, we had last a time, uh, or a couple of times ago, Daniel, the, the man in Daniel 10 and the man in, in Revelation 1. And as we go here, we're going to find uh, that the mentions of, uh, and the allusions, shall we say, to the book of Daniel in Revelation are thick and fast. And as we've gotten in these later chapters of, of Daniel, we will find that they're heavily alluded to in the book of Revelation. Okay, so we have that. Those who are written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life. Others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise, as it comes our, our memory gem, will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, 
you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Now, one of the things that has been misunderstood about this text many times is that the, they think it has something to do with um, human mobility, the fact that we can readily, we can go anywhere in the world within 24 hours or so, running to and fro. But in Hebrew, the, the meaning is quite clear. In Hebrew, it's the eyes that are running to and fro, and the eyes that are running, where are they running to and fro? On the book of Daniel. And so the book is rolled up and is sealed until the time of the end, but at the time of the end, it's going to be opened up. And many will be running to, but they'll be reading it to find meaning. And we shall find exactly how that takes place, or at least in symbol how it takes place as we go through this study. Because as usual, I'm going to have some slides here that demonstrate the similarities. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be? before these astonishing things are fulfilled. Now, the man who was clothed in linen it is not said specifically that it is the same man it was in 10, but we, that's where we had the picture of the man in linen and uh, the similarities. We talked about those. I'm not going to go through those again tonight. Uh, they were, uh, for those who were in our, our Sunday night uh, and on my Patreon page, I have uh, sent that out, the, the, the uh, similarities between uh, Daniel, I'm sorry, Revel, Daniel 10 and Revelation 1, the man in, in those two cases. Uh, and I will include those uh, with the uh, with one tonight. <laughs> My dear wife has joined us. That's good. Uh, I'll, I'll include that, that comparison for those who, who ask for it. But it has, there are some more comparisons that we're going to be making. How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? Man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, uh, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. That's what we're saying here. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be a time for a time, times, and half a time, when the power of the holy people has finally been broken, and all these things will be completed. Let me uh, scoot that up. This is very similar. I didn't include it in the comparisons because they're much more vague here. Yeah, I will be private providing. But this is very similar to the uh, the strong, the mighty angel in Daniel. Or, sorry, in Revelation ten, who stands with one foot on the sea and one foot on the land and raises. But he has an unsealed scroll in his left hand, and here we have the scroll. Is this the same scroll? Well, I wouldn't go that far. But the, the parallels are striking here between this and Revelation 10. Uh, and, and he is, you know, there we have the seven thunders and some other things. Um, I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying it will be your time, times, and half a time, when the power of the holy people has been finally been broken, all these things will be completed. I heard, but, but I did not understand. And that's very interesting because uh, we have similar thing in Revelation 10. John hears the seven thunders, but then he's told he can't write them down. So he hears, but we don't understand because he didn't tell us to us. And then he gets a similar thing here in that he's told to uh, seal it up. He replied, go your way, Daniel. Because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. In other words, even Daniel can't hear them. I just had a not too long ago, a debate with someone on, online about whether the book of Daniel was sealed for Daniel. And here's the quite clear uh, evidence of that. Daniel, Daniel's being told, you know, let it be. Go your way. Let things go. You're, you're not going to understand this. This is too much. But it will be understood eventually. Uh, many will be purified. Many made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. Again, we have a parallel in that those who are uh, holy be, remain holy, and those who are wicked remain wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. 
from that day, I'm sorry, from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation set up, there will be 1,290 days. Now, this isn't the time, time, and half times because that's 1,260 days. Blessed is the one who waits and for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. And so we have here in this one chapter three different uh, time periods. The time, times, and half a time, the uh, 1,290 days, and the 1,335 days. I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about this. It's in the uh, lesson. Uh, uh, I think it, that what they have is probably correct. Uh, but I'm I'm not wedded to precise dates because we may not be aware of all the things that are happening in the world and exactly what God has his eye on. But the approximate time period is pretty close. And if you take what they say, then the 1260 days would be 508 to 17, I'm sorry, 1290 days, 12, 1798, 538 to 1798. And the 1,335 days would run to 1843. Well, uh, that's pretty good because 1843, 44, we, we uh, tend to focus on October 22nd, 1844. But the, uh, that is the absolute end time of that prophecy. In other words, it may have, have occurred in some the, the absolute date of which... I don't know, uh, maybe sometime in 1843 and sometime in 1844. That's what William Miller said originally, and that's probably the, the, um, as precise as we humans can come. But it's good enough. Uh, what does it matter which particular day it was? It matters that something happened and something began to change. And again, as for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Well, now this is a, a really a marvelous, uh, marvelous passage for many, many reasons. One is that we have here in picture uh, the two resurrections. I don't, I'm not aware of anywhere else uh, until we get to Revelation. Certainly, the idea of a resurrection itself is not clear in the Old Testament. This is the clearest um, allusion to it. This is the clearest reference to, to a resurrection at all, that Daniel will rest. And that's said twice in this chapter. At the end, you will rest, and the end of your days you will receive, rise to receive, end of the days you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. And at the beginning, uh, he says the same thing. That many will be, many will uh, rest. Uh, many of those, I'm sorry, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. So here we have these two things. Um, we could go on, and it's not without uh, virtue to go with the, the Sabbath school lesson one day at a time, but I prefer. To do something a little different here, as you often know. Um, yeah, talking about who changes the course of history at the end of time. Uh, Michael, our prince. Michael, of course, is the one. That's what the word, the, the name Michael means. One who is like God. There is only one who is like God. And so he is our great prince. Uh, he is seen in Daniel uh, 9. He is seen again. Throughout the end of the then of the book of Daniel, it's, he's the active one, and again, uh, this isn't uh, as clear probably a reference to the great controversy as we have in Job, but it's pretty clear that the one who is our champion, our Goel to use the Old Testament word, uh, the one who is who is battling for us is Michael, the one who is like God. So I want to take a minute here. And uh, look at the comparisons. Again, these will be available in a chart. Oh, I need to. I've got a bit of a freaky mouse here. It wants to jump ahead. Really sounds strange when you think about it. And I want to look at the common or sim similar symbols 
throughout uh, the books of uh, Daniel and Revelation. I said that the um, the things are thick and fast here. Well, that's what's happening, is that the things become thick and fast. Uh, suddenly we have lots and lots of references. All right, let's see here. That's what I want. All right. And we start with Daniel 7.10. The court was sealed and the books were open. I'm starting here. Oh, that's no, that's fine. Because we already, I, the, uh, I'd say in other chapters because the first part of this chart, which if you want it, you can have, um, is uh, Daniel uh, 10, the man in Daniel 10 and the man in Revelation 1. Just because I wanted to have in one place a lot of these. And at the end of this list, it says it's not exhaustive. So I, I, there may be plenty more. But I, uh, this is what I had, uh, what I saw, and, and had the time to put together. Court was sealed; the books were open. In Revelation twenty twelve, and the books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things were, which were written in the books. So you had this court scene, court uh, scene, with books being opened in both cases. And that's uh, th there's a parallel in the, in the two situations. And we're going to look at, when we get to the end here, we're going to look at 2012 and, and comparison 710 in some detail because it's really a fascinating and encouraging, a, a delightful passage in the book of Revelation. It teaches us something that is so delightful to hear about ourselves and about God. All right. And maybe I should just get out of the way here, and I think I shall. And the beast was slain, and its body was destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. That's what it says after the judgment in 710. <clears throat> Excuse me. The beast was slain and thrown into the blazing fire. And of course, in Revelation... Uh, it says, uh, in 2010, it says, and the devil and who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. All right, so there's a judgment in both cases, and in both cases, the outcome is approximately the same, or very similar. Uh, the beast is thrown into the lake of fire. In 713, we see one like the Son of Man coming with the cloud of, uh, of Clouds of heaven. And of course, Revelation 1, 77, behold, he is coming with the clouds. Yes, the, be the beast and the devil are the same entity. And if you remember in, uh, in Revelation 12, uh, John is almost comical at, in point, to point it out because uh, the, the dragon is, is uh, Satan and the devil. He makes it clear. The, the, you know, nothing left here. And the, the similarity is so so uh, so clear uh, that the beast being thrown is also the devil being thrown to the lake of fire. No question about it. One like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. And here we have the parallel also in Revelation. All right, moving along. Um, these are uh, <clears throat> everyone whose name is found in the, in the book. We read that early on in the cha this chapter. Everyone whose name is written in the book is to be delivered. In Revelation 20.15, there's a book, a single book, because there are books and there's a book. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in the lake of fire. So in both cases, there is a book, and to have one's name in that book is to be saved, is to be delivered from the fire. Remember, when it's so appropriate for this final. Uh, lesson in the book of Daniel, the three great themes of Daniel is God is the God who rules. God is the God who gives wisdom, which he's clearly doing here, and it's showing that he will rule. And God is the God who delivers. And those who are in the book in Revelation, in chapter 12 of Daniel, and those who are in the, the book in chapter 2015 of Revelation, those are the ones who are delivered. To be in that book is to be delivered. Uh, no small thing, and we'll look at that in, in some detail, as I say, because the implications of that are amazing. Oops, that was a mistake. 
Let's see if I can get us back where we want to be. All right. All right. As we saw in 12.2, there are two resurrections. Remember that some who will sleep, the multitudes who sleep in the dust will be raised, some to uh, eternal life and some to uh, shame and everlasting contempt. So we have those two resurrections in 20, uh, Revelation 24 through 6. We have the first resurrection and the second resurrection. So you can see here the, the, the parallels between the two <clears throat> are quite large. And of course, well, we get, I think we get to that here in a moment. Yes, in uh, Revelation 12, 3, roll up and seal the, the words of the scroll. In Revelation chapters 6 through 10, a scroll is progressively unsealed, is opened. The, seal, the scroll is sealed in Daniel, and I'm not going to go so far as to say it is exactly the same scroll. The scroll in Revelation is a fascinating one for many, in many ways uh, because it's written on both sides, which scrolls were not. Uh, that's one reason books, or as they were called then, codices, a codex, was invented because you could have, it took less paper, less parchment. You could write on both sides of the page with a codex. Uh, there are other advantages, of course, but that was one of the main ones. You, you, it was somewhat more compact. Um, but anyway, the the, uh, the scroll in Revelation 12 is unsealed. And in fact, as I mentioned, the angel, which looks very much, the mighty angel in, in Revelation 10, who looks very much like one of this, this man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river in, in this chapter. Uh, in chapter 10, uh, that man, that, that being, um, mighty angel he's called, that being has an unsealed scroll in his hand. So, uh, this is certainly clear, clear uh, links between the two. In Revelation 7.25 and in Revelation 12.7, we have the expression a time, times, and half a time. And we have that same expression only in Greek in Revelation 12.14. And in Revelation 12, 14, the time, times, and half a time is the time that the uh, woman is in the desert. Uh, so that's all there. So there, th this is clearly a linked, uh, a clear, I, and it's, uh, it's quite clear. One of the interesting things, at least to me, one of the interesting things to me about the book of Revelation is that there are no quotations of the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. And yet, the book of Revelation is full of things which sound like the Old Testament, and things like this, time, times, and half a time, and there's plenty more. We've talked about some of them as we've gone through the book of Daniel. It tells me, well, one of the, one of the reasons we think why there are no quotes is that, Daniel, uh, that John was a prisoner on Patmos, and he was not allowed to have a books or a collection of books, so he didn't have anything to refer to except what was in his memory. Uh, it would also explain why the Greek in Revelation is very, very crude, because he didn't have a scribe or someone to help him with his work. And uh, as someone who is very uh, pleased to say that I've, I've written several books and many articles, I will also tell you that I have good editors, uh, for which I'm grateful. Um, because it's just another pair of eyes. It gets things cleaner. Uh, C.S. Lewis says that writing is like driving sheep down a road and they will turn in at any open gate. So when people find errors, uh, I don't feel badly. They're showing me open gates, which I can close. Anyway, uh, probably John didn't have any help at all, which is why the Greek is whatever he could do on the island, and he probably didn't have any books for reference, which is why uh, neither the uh, Hebrew or Aramaic Old Testament, the Talmud, which was available then, nor the um, Septuagint, which was in Greek, was available to him. But here we have a, a clear echo of uh, a, a passage in Daniel. It seems almost uh, impossible to deny that Daniel had this in mind. I'm sorry, that John had this in mind when he was writing. He had this passage, these passages of Daniel in mind when he was writing. He was trying to tell us Daniel understood 
what this time period was about. And of course, we have that we've talked about many times about the problem of prophetic foreshortening, which is in Daniel. He's farther away from the events than John the Revelator. And so even the events which were in the recent past or in the present tense of John and Revelation are well in the future of Daniel. And so anything in the future of John is really remote from Daniel. And become and so the, the symbols become more general and less detailed, just as I say, as if you were looking at a great distance through a telescope. If the farther you go, the less detailed, the fuzzier things will be. It's just the way it is. We're human beings. We're finite. And uh, <clears throat> for for Daniel or John, either one, to understand what they were being told, it would have to be in terms that they would understand. And how do you explain um, uh, the internet to someone who doesn't know what a computer is uh, or a computer? I mean, it's just it just becomes more and more difficult to see how they could possibly understand it. So some of these things, uh, they're they're just necessary because it's the way we are as humans. All right. I also want to look, and I hope that's clear. Again, if you have any questions or comments, I've, they've got a new setup on, on Facebook Live, and I can see uh, the comments, uh, I think, pretty contemporaneously, which is uh, a great help to me. And uh, for anybody who's curious, yes, I will be doing this at 6 p.m., only be much more interactive at 6 p.m. this coming Sunday evening. Um, Last Sunday evening, I was uh, in a minivan heading back from the Dakotas. Uh, and uh, they didn't have any toilet paper there either. All right. So here's the sum. The, these are all the things we found in these other chapters. We have this thing about the uh, those who are in the book will be delivered, for example. And those who are not found in the book in Revelation will be uh, lost and so forth. I'm not going to go through that again. Um, but let's take a look at the book versus the books. <clears throat> because this is a fascinating, to me, a fascinating situation. Ah, I said the comments were there, but then I see that was somewhat blocked. Hang on again. We'll... Uh, What's going on here? I just lost it. I will do my best. And it's running all over the place on me now. I don't know what's happening. Let's see. Uh, okay. Oh, what does I think? The, the significance of the scroll being written on both sides. Well. That is a... <laughs> That is a fascinating thing. I didn't really want to go into it. At, uh, I thought I'd, I might go into that more Sunday, but I'll be glad to to uh, take a shot at it. Let me, uh, if I'm going to talk about that, let's get up where you can actually see me. Um, the reason it's written on both sides, I believe. And I want to be certain that this is understood. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying absolutely or that it's beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's a difference between things which are exegetically defensible and those which are exegetically um, necessary, shall we say, or inevitable. There is a scroll in the Old Testament which is written on both sides, and it's found in Zechariah. It's a flying scroll. And on one side, it is written that anyone who lies, and on the other side, it's anyone who blasphemes, I believe. It's just off the top of my head here. In other words, what, it's, what the scroll, the flying scroll in Zechariah is talking about is it's the, it is the law of God. On one side is the, uh, the first four commandments, blasphemy. On the other side is the, the uh, six commandments of dealing with one another, uh, our in interaction with human beings. And so to some degree, what we have in Revelation, where we have the sealed scroll, is that, and it's possible because the book of the book of the law is is Deuteronomy. It's possible, and again, just possible, that um, the I believe what's taking place with the the seals in Revelation is that that Christ is 
uh, opening the seals to show uh, what, what is going to happen, the outcome of the violations of the law, and the, the way the, the Lamb will solve that problem is, why this, the book, is when the book is finally unsealed. We don't see it completely unsealed until Revelation 10. And uh, that's a, a difficult, <laughs> that whole chapter is a, is a difficult chapter. But that would be my take on why it is um, written on both sides. Because uh, it's, it's echoing the uh, scroll. If this wasn't for Daniel or his time, why would it be important for him to understand? Okay, well, that's a fair question. Again, some of these uh, are better handled when we can interact and we can go back and forth. Uh, but fools rush in, and uh, I'll do my best to answer it whether I should or not. Uh, why does th th this goes back to why prophecy is given at all? And when I say that, Remember that prophecy in Scripture has two primary functions, and that prediction of the future is not the main one. The primary function of Scripture, or I'm sorry, prophecy in the Old Testament, and we see this repeatedly, the primary function of prophecy in the Old Testament is what we call forthtelling, meaning God gives to his people through the prophets instruction, exhortation, encouragement, whatever. He is, the, prophet, the prophet's function is to be the spokesperson for God. In fact, when, Moses, uh, when is, uh, God asked Moses to, uh, to uh, lead the children of Israel in, in the book of Exodus at the burning bush, uh, he says, I have a heavy tongue. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not good at speech. I don't speak fluidly. I'm not, I'm not glib, you might say. Uh, we'd say silver-tongued or something. And so God says, well, I'll give you Moses as your prophet. What he means is Moses as your spokesperson. The primary function of, of prophecy and prophets in the Old Testament is to speak for God. And, and most of the time, because there are not that many predictions, we know of many prophets who know, didn't write books, didn't leave anything written behind. They're written about, perhaps, Nathan is a perfect example of that. They're written about, but they are not uh, themselves. They don't themselves leave behind a book, and they don't leave. We know, as far as we know, they don't have many predictions because they're telling. That they, there's there's forth telling and foretelling. Uh, Jesus says in the Gospel of John that uh, he tells us these things. He gives us these prophecies, these predictions. What we think of as prophecy predictive prophecy, not so that it can make us to be prophets, to be smart people. We know better. And one of the mistakes we sometimes make is that um, we think that the important part is that we know more than everybody else. We, rec we even recruit membership members on this notion that, uh, you know, we, you'll be in the know. You'll know more than other people. Uh, that's not the purpose of prophecy, according to Jesus. Purpose of prophecy is so that when it's fulfilled, we will believe. But what Daniel is getting here, and he, Daniel is, is troubled by this. That's what we see repeatedly in here, in, in this. Uh, let me see. I wasn't going to do that now, but it will just go there uh, because that's what people want to do. That's what the question is. Let's do that. Let's see how that works. All right. Uh, no, that's what I want this one. There we go. Look down in verse 8, and I'll help you with that. I'll highlight that. There we go. Verse 8. Daniel says, I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? Daniel, if you recall from, uh, from chapter 8 onward, has been struggling with this. It's, it's too much. 2,300 years, and then will the, when the, the sanctuary be vindicated, uh, he's overwhelmed, as you and I would be, as I, I say this before. Imagine if God had told the pioneers in the Adventist church, it'll be more than 200 years. 
It'll be it's 170 years already since 1844. It'll be that long. They would they would have been overwhelmed. What's the point? How can you do this? Or if you told them, well, you know what? There are going to be seven billion people in this world, and you have to the, the gospel has to be preached as a witness to the whole entire world. It would just be overwhelming. God knows that we're dust, and we can't take this sort of thing. And Daniel, he, Daniel's asked for it, and God has given him a view to the future with the focus in these chapters on how the whole thing will end. That is to say that God will deliver his people, and God will, as he says to Daniel, that you will rest, but at the end you will get what you, you will get your inheritance. And so the purpose of this is to give to Daniel specifically and to all the people who are in exile and who have, are wondering, again, the, probably uh, the uh, Daniel 10, 9 and 10 come about because they started to rebuild the temple and then there's been a delay. It looked like things were going to move forward and then they don't for a while. And, and, and Daniel say, well, what's, gonna, what's it going to take? You know, you got the people back there. They started, but nothing's happening. You know, it's, it's hard to maintain our faith when we're always in what I've called the messy middle. Uh, we're not at the beginning where everything's exciting, and we're not at the end where everything is exciting. We're in the middle where it looks like it's the same as yesterday and tomorrow. And so Daniel is overwhelmed by this, and that's why he says, well, here, you have what you need, Daniel. What you need is you need to understand that I will take care of this, that Michael the prince is going to stand up for you, and Michael the prince is going to win. And when this is all over, you will sleep. It won't be troubled by most of this. You will sleep, and you will receive your inheritance. And that's what he says here. I did not understand, so I asked my Lord, what will be the outcome of all this be? And he said, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined. So don't worry about it. There will be many. Uh, your work is part of this. Michael will be saving many people, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. So, blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 13 and 35 days. As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest. This is what God tells Job. Job uh, is never given the reason for why he's put through such suffering. Job is never given the, the uh, preview that we have. We, he, we get to see the curtain pulled back, and we understand that it was God's character that was being questioned. And that's why all this took place for poor Job. But God shows Job all the marvelous things that he's done, that he's created. You know, he says, Who can, can you bind the Pleiades or lead the, the bear, the great, the big dipper? Can you bring the bear out? Can you feed the, mount, the lions on the mountaintops? Can you set the limit for the sea? Can you do any of those things? Of course, Job says, well, okay, I see this is, you know, you're asking me about things that are too big for me. And God's saying, well, maybe this other's too big for you too. Maybe there are things going on you don't understand. And if you can trust me to feed the lions on the mountaintops and to continue to lead Ursa Major around in the sky, if the big bear, if you, can, if you can trust me to keep the ocean where it belongs, then maybe you can trust me for the things you don't understand. And that's what's going on here. God is saying to Daniel, I've given you more of a view than anybody else has, has ever had, and it's too much for you. It'll be too much for anybody until the time of the end. We're back to Shore and Kierkegaard saying that life is understood backwards and is lived forwards. Daniel's still living it forwards, and he there's so much, he's been shown so much in the future that he can't begin to comprehend it. And that's where we are. We, we just happen to be further along. We can look back and see more of the events in these prophecies. But that's the whole point, as Jesus said, it's not so that we can be so smart about the future and our charts and, you know, all these things. I mean, as I said, somebody, you get the feeling with some of these charts, you can set a stopwatch and know exactly when the end will come. That's ridiculous. It's not the way we are. It's not the way God works. And that's what God is saying to Daniel. Okay, you've, you've had this. Trust me. Understand. And 
when the time comes, when the, the generation comes that has lived enough of this to look back and understand, they will believe. Again, Jesus says, I gave you these prophecies so that when they are fulfilled, you will believe. We will understand that God is, in fact, in control and God is, in fact, watching and taking care of things. I hope that answers your question. Uh, one of the things I often say is that I answered or just bury it. But I hope I answered it. Anyway, I'd like to get back and finish this up because I want to show you something which I find incredibly um, encouraging about about this situation. And that is this business about the book and books in in Daniel and Revelation. The book he talked to those in the those in the book in Daniel are to be delivered. Let's do this. All right. Oops. Well, that didn't work. You know, those in the book will be delivered, Daniel is told. And in the in Revelation, those who are not in this book are thrown to the lake of fire. It's just two sides of the same coin. In the one case, if you're in the book, you're saved. In the other case, if you're not in the book, you're, you're destroyed. Meaning that if you're in the book, you are not destroyed. You are saved. You're, you're redeemed. All right. And then, here's what, this is Revelation. Those in the books judged, are in judged, I'm sorry, in Daniel, in Daniel and in both Revelation, they're both, of that, that, those who are in the books are judged. So now we go back to, Dan, to Revelation 20. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And I want you to see how this works, because it says, and books were opened, books plural, all right, and another book, was opened, which is the book of life. So there are books on the one hand, which are not the book of life. They are books, and they are, as we shall see in a moment, record books. They're accounting books. But there's this one book, and it is the book of life. Okay? And now, the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. That's because these are the dead from the second resurrection. The first resurrection, they're in the book of life. Okay? So here are the people from the second resurrection. The dead were judged. They, they, they've been raised according to what they had done, the, uh, what they had, their works, their actions, as recorded in the books. Okay? They're judged. But who's not judged here? Who is not judged here? those who were in the first resurrection because they're there in the book of life. And so the books are by that by which we are judged, but those who were in the book of life are not judged as those who were just resurrected who are judged by their works. We, thank God, are not judged by our works. We are judged by our commitment to Jesus Christ. And his performance his works are perfect. And therefore, when we are judged, we're not judged that way at all. We're put in the book of life because we are seen to have his perfect works credited to our account. Okay, I hope that that's clear. For me, this is a fascinating thing because those who are in the books are, are judged. But those who are in the book of life are not judged. How about that? How about that? I find that to be absolutely fascinating. And to be blunt, absolutely delightful. If I am found in the book of life, if I am committed to Christ, that I am in the book of life. My, his works are credited to me, and I'll be a part of the first resurrection. The same is true of you. If you're committed to Christ, then you will be in that book of life, and as long as you're in that book of life, you will not be judged. Or if you want to put it that way, you'll be a judged person. Either way you want to look at it, 
Because those who are in, in Revelation, those who are in the book are not judged. In Daniel, those who are in the book are delivered. We want to be in that book. That old song, which has become much overused and misused probably, uh, is certainly appropriate here. When the saints go marching in, and that is, Oh Lord, I want to be in that number. I want to be in the number of those who are in the book, because that book is the book of life. And that's where we end up with Daniel. We could go through piece by piece and find everything here at the time. We mentioned the time periods. But the important message of Daniel is that the reason Daniel is written as it is is because God's people are in exile. God's people are far away from their home. They have no temple. There is no place for them to worship. And then, you know, Daniel has, has prayed in Daniel 9 because of the, and again, we talked about the uh, day for year principle, which is inherent in the entire thing, uh, inherent in the entire uh, uh, context of Revelation is the 70 years, uh, the, the uh, Sabbaths of the land. So it has to be year for day. The idea that this other thing is just silly. It has to be something else. That, that just violates the whole, the whole context of the entire book of Daniel. But we know, and of course Daniel, as we said, was sealed. But we also know that the story of Daniel, I, I talked about this in the very first lesson, I believe, and certainly in the second one, that the first chapter of Daniel is uh, modeled directly upon Joseph. Uh, those, again, you can find that if you want them. And uh, uh, that's, you know, they're, t they're saying to the people who are in exile, remember that God delivered the children of Israel with, be, but through Joseph? Well, Daniel is the new Joseph. He's the one who's taken to captivity. He's the one who's threatened with death. He's the one who interprets the dream, and he's the one who is made second in the kingdom. Daniel is modeled on the Joseph story. I don't mean that just that the events happened the same way, which they probably did. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that the author of the book is intentionally modeling it so that the people who are the people of Israel who are in exile at that time can see it and say, "Ah, we see that God is working in us and in our people right now." God has not forgotten us, and that's always hard. We talk about this repeatedly, about um, the uh, you know narrative stories, and it includes the story of the Bible. There's a beginning, there's the middle, and there's the end. In the beginning, there's the excitement of everything be the commencing. We send them, they sing the children back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city, and they're all excited because it's going to happen, and then it's stalled. And that's why Daniel prays in Daniel nine. He's 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 frustrated because it looked like as he's you know he's in his eighties. Uh, he's he knows he doesn't have long to live, and he wants to see the temple rebuilt. And it starts out, and that's exciting, and then it stops. And we're not at the end. We're not seeing. He's not seeing the deliverance of the people of God. He's not seeing it take place. Well, that's where most of the people of God have lived all throughout history. You know, the 400 years of slavery, people live in the messy middle. And they may not have, they may for generations have not known anything but slavery. May not have for generations not known anything but waiting. Here we are in the Adventist church, and it's been 140, 170 years, 100 and almost 180 years soon, since 1844. We're in the messy middle. We don't have the excitement of the early days of thinking Christ is coming maybe tomorrow, you know. Maybe in a week or two, do you see your Lord a-coming, that wonderful Advent hymn? There you are. But that was 170 years ago, and, and it seems like, in many ways, things are not progressing. We're in that messy middle. We're not seeing the signs of the end. Of course, we're looking for them all the time and sometimes projecting in ways that we shouldn't. But we're, we're, we're just living, you know, the way my parents did, the way their parents did before them. I don't see the end coming. 
Uh, do I see the things are getting worse? Yes, but, you know, I don't know how long it is. And we live in that messy middle. Well, Daniel finds himself there again in his 80s, and that's what's so concerning to him, what's so upsetting to him. And so there he goes. He, and this, this prophecy comes, and he says, God is saying to him, look, Michael the prince, the one who is like God, he, he doesn't yet. Daniel's not yet in a position theologically to understand the incarnation. Who is? Even after it happens, it's a, it's a, it's a mystery. It's, it's a wonderful thing, but it's a mystery how, how someone can be 100% God and 100% man at the same time. And so before this happens, uh, the, that's the message of Hebrews. Everything was fragmentary before this. And so here we are, and, and, and Daniel is, is 80, and like a, an older friend of mine said, I, he, you know, he didn't buy green bananas anymore. He doesn't have much time left. He wants to see this move forward. And the angels come, and they reassure him, and they say, Michael the prince, the one who is like God, your prince, he is active. He has been fighting the prince of Persia for you. That three weeks that you spent in fasting, it wasn't that God wasn't answering. It was that he had already begun to answer. And the same thing is here, that he's being told repeatedly by Michael, by these, by these beings, uh, some divine attributes, certainly, certainly angels, that Michael, your prince, is going to deliver you. And that's all any of us needs to know. There's only so much. I don't know what's going to happen with the, with the coronavirus. I'm, I don't need to know that. What I do need to do, I do need to do today and tomorrow, and as many days as I have after that, is to learn to trust God. Because uh, although I don't, it doesn't look likely that I'm going to live through the time of trouble. Uh, who knows? I don't know. But the only way any of us is going to get through the time of trouble is in trusting God. It's not because we're, uh, we've got all the Bible memorized or we've gone through a checklist and confessed every single one of our sins because we don't even know how half, what a half of them are. But it's because we have learned to completely trust God. Uh, I don't have time to do that tonight, but I talk about perfection of commitment. That's what God wants. Not perfection of performance. It's not possible for us. But perfection of commitment, we would rather die than knowingly commit a wrong act. And that's been seen in the book of Daniel twice. In Daniel 3, with the three Hebrew warriors in Daniel 6, with Daniel the lion's den. We've seen it many times in other situations. And so what Daniel's being told here is, be at rest. Be at rest. Because Michael, your prince, is going to deliver you. He is working constantly on your behalf. We are so blessed because we live in this time. And we have Paul saying that Christ, that's Michael, our prince, ever lives to make intercession. Wow. He is always interceding for you and me. So that's what he lives for. Uh, it's an amazing thing. So what we get from this is what we're supposed to get from all prophecy, as Jesus said. We look at it. We understand that, first of all, prophets are forthtelling. They're giving God's people his instruction, his encouragement, his exhortation. And right now, this is mainly what Daniel's getting. There's a vision, and it has time periods. But he's saying, God is working on your behalf. God is for you, as Paul says. If God is for us, who can be against us? And so it's that kind of thing. And when these prophecies are fulfilled, whenever it is, then we will believe. That's what Jesus says, prophecy is given. And so, my friends, I've come really taking more time than I wanted to tonight. But the book of Daniel is a marvelous thing that Daniel asked for so much and God gave him so much because Daniel was so dedicated to serving God and to understanding his will that it was more than he could handle. And that's good in a way. The blessings that God gives each one of us are more than we can begin to understand or to handle. And as we sit today in a world that's panicked, and is terrified by coronavirus. I don't know. Uh, I suspect uh, that I'll live through it, but I don't know that I will. But I do know this. The only place any of us is ever safe is in the hollow of his hand. 
And what the message of Daniel 12 is, is that that's where we are if we trust God. Michael, our Prince, Christ, our intercessor, is ever working on our behalf. He knows the details we don't begin to comprehend, and he will ultimately prevail. And those of us who remain committed to him, like Daniel, we may go to our rest. And if that's true, it'll be a blessing. Because we won't have to worry about all the, the latest headlines or the latest stock market prices. That's the message of Daniel. God is working on your behalf. Now, we are all exiles. C.S. Lewis says that we're, we're, we're like spies behind enemy lines. And when we attend church, and we'll have to do that virtually this weekend. Uh, we're in these cells and we're, we're passing on information from high command. That's what prayer is about, is communicating to God. We're in exile here. We're pilgrims here. But just like Daniel, who was in exile, God is active in us and through us to make his will take place. And that is the greatest thing anyone can experience. Well, I'm going to have to go. It's too late. Uh, I've taken a lot of your time. And uh, if you are interested in this, uh, this will be available. I'll be putting up an edited version. Of course, most of the, uh, I'm trying to get them all up there, but I've, I've been very busy. Uh, most of these lessons are available on my Patreon page, uh, and most of them are free. So um, I have other things, if you're more interested in, in other things, that you can get there. Uh, and uh, in any case, uh, I just uh, thank you for staying with me. I want to say this. <laughs> I, I talk too much, I'm afraid. Uh, my wife, uh, my dear sweet wife, she is by far my better half, says that listening to me talk can be like getting a drink at a fire hydrant. <laughs> For that, I apologize. But uh, I want to say is I've been excited. I've been, I've been enjoying Daniel. As excited as I've been, I really am excited about hermeneutics, uh, the, the, our new lessons, which I'll be taking up next week because I'm always a week ahead. How to understand the Bible. When I was 23, I've told this story here before. When I was 23, I said, Lord, I don't really enjoy studying the Bible. Give me a hunger for your word. Friends, don't pray that unless you're serious. Because I've, I've felt that ever since. I, he gave me a hunger for his word. And hermeneutics is simply the process of learning how to understand. And I call this Bible journeys. That's the way I find Bible study. It's an exciting journey. And we discover the treasures of the word of God as we study his word. And I hope that you can join me. I hope that you will experience that delight and that excitement. And hermeneutics is simply finding out how to dig. Years ago, my family and I stopped at Crater of Diamonds in uh, Arkansas, which they find about a diamond a day there. People find diamonds, and they're sometimes quite large. They're worth, one was worth half a million dollars. And we went out, and they showed us several techniques. There are ways to find the diamonds. Um, one of the things we discovered, of course, is that uh, if you uh, make money at it, it's probably hard work. We looked and we didn't happen to find any diamonds, but they say they find an average a day, a one a day. Point is that the looking is part of the process. In And when we, I guarantee you this, if you learn how to honestly and openly come to God and study his word, if you will mine that word, you will find gold. You will find diamonds every day. I still do. And I'm hoping as we go through this discussion of how to study the Bible, that's what hermeneutics is, that each of you gets a new vision of the greatness of God's Word. Well, I must go. Keep, keep your faith. Uh, we may have to be physically somewhat distant in order to be wise. Uh, but God is with you at every moment. And again, if you're interested in more in-depth study and more interactive. I'm holding a Zoom session Sunday night at 6. And if you like it, send, uh, send me an email saying you want to be involved at, uh, let me pull it up here. I'll get it up here. Yep. Biblejourneys at yahoo.com. 
Okay, BibleJourneys at Yahoo.com. Send, send me an email, and uh, I will send you uh, the uh, comparison chart that I did tonight. You can have that whether you come to that or not. But I'll send you that comparison chart and maybe some other stuff. I've always got things I'm developing for that study. And I will send you a link where you can, be, if you have a computer with a camera and a, and a mic, or either one, you know, so that we can hear and or see you. Uh, it can be interactive, and it's free to you. So Sunday evening at 6, if you're interested in that. Until then, may God give you rest and peace, and that you will be able to uh, praise his name. Well, I have to go. Uh, my wife does like to see me once in a while. Blessings to you all, and I hope to see you next week as we begin our study. How to study the Bible. Thank you. And good evening.